You've only got to go through the graduates over the last 10 years, I suppose, and there's some household names that have come from those sales. The breeze-ups actually guarantee you're seeing something you'll like. The quality of the horse going in is improving. There is a massive yearning for the breeze-up horses, and what you ultimately are selling is the dream of Royal Ascot winners, aren't you? The breeze-up's stronger than ever. I'm Jess Stafford and over the last few weeks we've been speaking to a variety of trainers, bloodstock agents and syndicate members about the Breeze Up sales. The whole perception of Breeze Up sales has definitely, definitely changed. There's Guineas winners, there's Classic winners, there's Classic seconds. As they've evolved, you're suddenly seeing Gold Cup winners coming out of it. In this three-part mini-series, we'll be asking them why the Breeze Up sales, what they're looking for and their insightful ways of finding the best value for money. So today we are joined by Bloodstock agent to the stars and renowned in the breeze up industry in particular with Richard Brown who has not only been a champion in his role as a Bloodstock agent and is award winning as well as had a very memorable last couple of years and the breeze ups as a, a part of the industry is always championed and also we have David Simcock, a racehorse trainer, classic racehorse trainer and his classic winner came from the breeze ups amongst a plethora of others and we've also got Charlie Haythorne from JHJW Consulting who provides horse racing analytics to the bloodstock industry and to others so thank you for joining me it's great to see you guys here um, as we enter into another year for the flat turf season and Richard after a, the success of the last few years, I'm sure you're looking forward to a new uh, flurry of horses that you can look up at the Breeze Ups. And I suppose my first question is, why the Breeze Ups year after year? Why do you champion them above all the other sales? Uh, at the moment, probably because of the, uh, the success, the amount of good horses that are coming out, at, out, out of the sales, not only horses that we've bought, but that other people have bought as well. Um, you've only got to go through the graduates over the last 10 years, I suppose, and there's some, you know, there's some household names that have, that have come from those sales and m almost all fairly reasonably priced in compared to what you have to pay in other markets. So the price and the value of the Breeze Ups is what I imagine a lot of people saw back in the early days was the, a reason for, to find a sort of a, a gap in the market. Do you think that the value of Breeze Ups still exists or is it the, the success of it has pushed up the prices? I think, I personally think that there's still a significant amount of value there because there's so much more that you can see. For the horse to have got to a Breeze Up sale, he's, he's come through a preparation, he or she has come through a preparation, their sound of wind, their sound of limb, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, they have to jump through a, a number of hoops. But because you've got so much further, you're taking so many of the sort of questions when you buy a yearling out of it, um, and I personally still believe that there is, yeah, I think it's an undervalued part of the market. Okay, and with the, the, your approach to Breeze Ups in particular, because plenty of, of people who see the sales, follow sales, see, you know, we can see a horse doing a little bit more exercise than you would see walking and in around the in the yearling sales. What is your methodology, without giving too many secrets away, what is the approach, the Richard Brown approach? Um, well, it's certainly not just the Richard Brown approach, it's a sort of Blanford bloodstock approach, and I work very closely with... Tom Goff, Tom Biggs and Stuart Bowman and it's a really big team effort and um, I suppose it, it's it's like everything it's like you know the same when you're buying a yearling you're you're looking for a lot of different pieces to, to fall into place mm -hmm. as you say with a yearling you really can see the horse stood up watch it walk up and down that's all you can see uh, with a breeze up you can see them you know with a breeze up horse and a breeze up side you see them gallop over two furlongs you're seeing them uh, gallop out you then have the same you see them at the sale so for us there's numerous pieces. Uh, one is how the horse looks, how the horse behaves, how the horse breezes, what time has he clocked is an important part of it, uh, and also the horse's temperament. Uh, that's a big part of it for us. These are young horses and they are asked to do a lot, and if they can come through that and show that they can take it mentally, that's a, that's a big part of it. I'm fascinated about time because I feel potentially a common misconception in breeze ups, especially in the UK, is that it's all about time. Whereas in America, it is that is the, the, the real reason why people head to the breeze ups, they want to see the fastest time. Do you think that that overshadows the kind of horse that you can get out of the breeze up? And is it your number one selection? Where does it factor in? How, how heavily justified does a horse's time make in the reckoning when you buy it? It's definitely not number one. 
because I think history would show you, and probably Charlie would be able to answer this better than me, but history would probably show you that if you just went to a sale and bought the, mo the, the fastest horse in every sale, mm -hmm. A, they're going to cost a lot of money, and B, their success rate is not, not, it's not a guarantee. So it is a part of the process, and it, it is an important part of the process. Um, is it number one? I, I don't think you. I don't think you can weigh any of the things that you're looking at that I said as as, as number one or number. There's probably five or six things that all have to fit in place. Mm -hmm. So time is important, but it's not necessarily that they have to be the fastest or the fifth fastest. It, in fact, a number of the better horses that we've bought haven't been in the top ten, even top twenty in terms of raw times. So there's also other things that we're looking at within the times. Where are they clocking their time and how are they getting their time? And I think that's, that's important too. So yeah, it's, it's certainly not just as quick. As, it's, so it's not just as simple as picking out the fastest time. Yeah, and to the point, at that point, Charlie, you've obviously number crunch. You're looking at the numbers. The data is extremely important. Um, what can you tell us about time and over the last few years, the course of, course of how popular the, the breeze ups have become? What is it about all the attributes that you number crunch around? What do you think has become the most interesting aspect of the breeze? Uh, yeah, I think we look at quite a few. Of, we look at many of the same things that Richard and Blanford look at and many other bloodstock agents. Uh, and just back on the time thing, it's important to put the, the breeze time of the horse in the context of the overall profile of the horse. Mm -hmm. Uh, so some pedigrees, you actually see some size tend to consistently be in the top, the top breeze times, yeah. but that doesn't necessarily f f reflect forward when they go to the track. You also have some consigners who tend to breeze their horses in a slightly faster way. And so the time is not everything at all, but it's important to put the time in the context of the rest of the horse's performance. Mm -hmm. And so we also measure stride length. And we do that using the videos that the, the sales company publish uh, painstakingly. Uh, and then the, the relationship between the stride length and the pedigree, the stride length and the time are also important things that we consider. Yeah, and so we're, we're talking about the, the breeze itself, but all the parts outside of it possibly are, aren't the areas that we as sort of the public, when we look back at sort of race, the results at, at the sales, we see, we can't see what the horses are like in the build up, we can't see them afterwards. How important is that? How, how important is how they canter down to the start of the breeze? How important how they've come out of it? What are those moments for you like in, in your selection of these horses? Very is the answer. Um, you know, before they breeze, they have to walk around at the start. Uh, and that is, again, you know, you're simulating race conditions. Mm. Uh, they have to go down on their own, canter down on their own or, or with one or two others. They then have to mill around at the start. And that is where, you know, that's where you can really you can judge a lot about temperament. They know they can see other horses um, galloping. They know that they're going to do that. Are they worrying about it? If they're not, then you know it's a very it's a very good sign. And as I say, that's what they have to do, right? This is what these guys have to do. They're going to have to get down there. You know, it's a lot for a young horse, and it's, it simulates walking around at the start before a race. And David, to that point, when you see a horse um, in the breeze and afterwards, what? What kind of alerts you to one that you think that's going to fit into my personal string of horses? Obviously, all trainers are different. Some want to get get going with them quickly, but what what makes you think that's going to be a David Simcock horse? Um, I think putting putting all parts of the puzzle together, or fitting all parts of the puzzle together. But you know, for me, looking at temperament is is key. Um, and going into the finer details, as Richard just said, of what they're doing at the start, how they've cantered down, mm. how, what's their style of of galloping, um, you know, you don't want to see a horse with his head up. You don't want to see a horse sweating. Um, we always like to see a horse finish off strong. Um, but again, that's where someone like Charlie and Richard use the times to see what have they done first furlong compared to what are they doing second furlong, and how they're galloping out and how they're finishing off the the actual breeze. Um, and the other point that's really really important is where the vet fits in everything as well yeah, yeah. Um, you know that whole how a horse vets you know they, they've 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 trained tough to get to this point mm. um, and you want to know how much attrition there is how, you know how much pressure has been putting on their bones um, the ligaments tendons etc etc um, and it is fitting that jigsaw together and between myself Richard Charlie um, you know that's that's what we're actually quite good at yeah and there's obviously a, a thought, and probably if, from an outsider's perspective, that 
these horses are trained to be fast and they, they might be a little bit fried mentally because of it. But you're a trainer that's probably better known to give horses some time and, and not to necessarily feel like you need to get them out sort of 10 days later. Have you, are you a, a good example of what, of, of what really can come out of the cells, of these kind of cells, that they don't always have to be so fizzed up and they're actually quite relaxed animals? Yeah, I, I, a lot, lot, lot of it's to do with the client you're buying for. Um, yeah. If he's prepared to give us that little bit of time, somebody wants some immediate success. Um, we've never gone down that route, um, but some do and some are very good at it. You know, buying from the breeze and running two weeks later and they get su success at it. Um, more often than not, they don't. But mm -hmm. our, our methodology, if you like, is, listen, they've had a hard time to get to that point and sales is, you know, it, it, mentally the whole um, from start to finish is quite a lot for them. So we tend to give them a short break and think life's a little bit easier for a while and then, um, you know, bring them back up from there. And Richard, you've got obviously a, a range of clients who have a range of needs as well. So, you know, David might be looking for that kind of long longevity and um, giving it a break. But then, for example, Perfect Power, who we're going to have a, we'll have a look at what he did in his breeze. He was instant. Was that, were you always looking for a horse like that or... Do horses sort of surprise you? You don't. You're not necessarily looking for a horse that needs to run immediately. I, th I, th I think no. I think with the breeze ups, you know, you, you know at the sale whether you're going to buy a horse um, that you're going to give a break to, or whether you're going to buy a horse. And, and I always say it's exactly as David said. It's client by client. Um, and, and I would always very much highlight to the client that this is a horse that we're going to give a month off. Mm. I then see him coming back and being a July horse, or like you know. With David, we bought plenty of horses that might not run till till the back end, and then we're looking at much more of a three-year-old type. But certainly, with the likes of a of a Perfect Power, he was uh, it was very clear that he was a mature two-year-old type. And I always say to the client, look, let's give them a chance of being an Ascot horse, mm -hmm. um, and then you can always back off them. So you, you know, you send them into training. We said the horse went straight into him, for example, went straight into Richard. Um, and said to Sheikh Rashid, let's give him a chance of being an Ascot horse. If he'd said at some point, I'm not ready, he'd obviously back off him. But, you know, he, he took it, went forward and, and, and obviously won there. Yeah, and we, we touched on sort of the consigners and who you're buying from as well. Um, you know, you can look through your list and you've, there's a broad range, but there's also a couple that you've, you've gone back and there's been a tried and tested approach that's worked, like the likes of Tally Ho. How important do they play in the process? And when do you, do you go and even see these horses before you see them at these breeze up sales? Uh, look, definitely, and Tally Ho is probably a very good example. Um, David and I bought Dream Ahead off, off, off Roger. He won five Group Ones. Um, you know, he was, a, he was a genuine, you know, superstar, certainly for us, but I think generally. Um, the, so yes, it's like everything, isn't it? You, you have success, you like to go back. Um, you know, our dad and Perfect Power came off Roger as well, but we've bought plenty of good horses off other consigners. Uh, and these guys are very, very good at what they do. They're some of the best horsemen on planet Earth. And you know, there's, there's lots of very good consigners out there and lots of very good horses. In terms of going round the, um, uh, looking at them, I did it once, and I think it was the worst group of breeze-up really? horses I ever bought. Really? So That's I didn't go yeah. again. <laughs> yeah. And would that be very different to other bloodstock agents who want to sort? You know, you know, there's pl plenty for before yearling sales. Bloodstock agents go off and see them at their at their studs and whatever to try and get their their, their cards marked, so to speak. Is that not something that you? There's plenty of guys that go around who've bought a lot of good horses as well. It's it's horses for courses. Mm -hmm. um, for for me, it p didn't particularly work. I kind of think that. They have to show up on the day. You know, you go to a race, they've got to show up on that day. And so I, yes, maybe we do miss a couple of horses, but I, we judge them on what they do on sale day because when they go to the races, they're going to have to turn up and do it on race day. Yeah, absolutely. In, in general, the breeze ups, what, what I've noticed, there's so many more variables to work with, aren't there? And Charlie, for you, that's what makes it a lot more interesting than, say, from a yearling perspective when you're trying to number crunch and work out. Yeah. So that, does that help you provide a better service for your clients? Yeah, well, essentially, it's a, it's a simulation of 200 horses in the same race. They're running down the same mm. gallop, the same thing like that. And the amount of information you get from watching uh, a horse race on TV there's 10 or 10 or 12 horses with this we've got 200 horses at the sale that we can see how as richard said how they perform under race conditions and you just have all there's so much information available to the buyer that the vendors want to show that the, their best attribute of their horse and the data can help to reveal 
certain aspects of horses that may not have necessarily done a good time, but mm. have posted very good other data points elsewhere. Yeah, so would you look at horses that po possibly have disappointed you time-wise and are happy to, say, if I was at, at a yearling sale and a horse, you know, it's probably slightly turns in a little bit, or there's something not quite right, but you f will forgive it because you think it's going to grow into this, you'll forgive a time because you've seen something else that's good about it, that sort of weighs it up uh, in a way? Yeah, very much. I mean, exactly as you're saying there with sort of confirmation faults, I think in general we are... Well, certainly, I try to be very forgiving on confirmation faults, as Dave will probably tell you, when some of the wonky yearlings that I've bought over the years have turned <laughs> up in the yard. Um, I think we are generally very forgiving, but at the breeze up, she can be even more forgiving because if there's a horse with a, you know, toes in, as you say, and, you know, but is sound on that leg and has come through a six month preparation and can go, you know, and can go race pace and, and comes out of it sound, well, may well have an offset and he may well tow him, but it's sound, yeah, I mean, you can, you can proceed with confidence. That's the major advantage, I imagine, David, is that, you know, you see a yearling, you, it's never had tack on its back, it can walk, that's fine, but being able to prove that it can actually generally move, it's a completely def different kettle of fish, is that, is, is, has the breeze up sales now become your, your go-to, or how, what, what would be the percentage between yearlings and, and breeze ups that you buy? Um, we definitely buy more breeze ups than we would yearlings, between us. Um, I, I still get sent home breads, obviously, but for me, I, I look at it that say my order is 50,000 or 100,000. For me, if I had spent 100,000 at book one or book two, it guarantees me absolutely nothing. Mm. Um, I, you know, it, it could be the slowest horse on four legs. It might not be able to put one foot in front of the other when it comes to cantering. The breeze ups actually guarantee you're seeing something you'll like and it can move and it can move quite quickly because mm. the data's there in front of you. So for straight away, that's value for money. Um, it, it, it's almost, I'm, my whole model and my business model has always been to sell horses all the way along. Um, and if I'm getting what I consider an 86 to 90 rated three-year-old, I know I'm going to get very well paid, which means my client's going to get very well paid. And that for me is the important part. And I can, I can, I, I wouldn't know what percentage is, but you can guarantee it's a lot higher at the breeze ups than it is at the yearning sales. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for a client to know that, when you're talking those sort of numbers, yeah. it's a nice place to be. Um, the whole perception of breeze up sales has definitely, definitely changed. Um, once upon a time, when we started training, it was definitely, you know, you were buying speed and that was it. You were mm -hmm. buying five and six furlong horses to go straight away, a lot of it being cheap speed. The breeze up sales is. It have they, as they've evolved, you're suddenly seeing Gold Cup winners coming out of it, mm. um, the best stayers in the country, fantastic middle distance horses, Grey Gatsby et al, you know, top milers mm. and obviously very good sprinters. So across the range, and this is down to those guys that are buying them, those guys that are um, preparing them. Mm. And like Richard said, there's nobody better. These guys are the best. They really, really are. Um, be frightening if they started training. Really, yeah. really be out of a job. <laughs> they're doing very well doing what they're doing. I think they they get a real kick out of it. And we were we actually mentioned this before we started that that it has changed from horses who just couldn't be sold, went unsold in the sales ring as a yearling to being horses that these very clever people are seeing are going to be better in four or five months' time just for that time. And whatever they see, they're right. They're really really good at it. And that, that they're, I think a big part of the breeze up success is the fact that these are being selected in the very first place by, you know, as you say, breeze up started by being yearlings that weren't sold. Now, if, a thou if there's, I don't know, what, how many horses get sold, Charlie? A thousand, roughly? Yeah, about a thousand. A yeah, thousand, yeah. I would say 800 of those mm. are probably selected, maybe more. I don't, I don't actually know what that is, but certainly 750, 800 of those have been selected by some of the best horsemen on planet earth so you've already had a massive filtration process to get to that so mm. the starting base is a group of horses selected by exceptional horsemen and then on it goes to their preparation of them and yeah i mean that's it's yeah it's a huge part of the reason that's so successful and we will we'll go on to the horses in particular some of the success stories but if you were to if a client came to you never met them they came to you heard about richard brown who's who's won a, he's bought a derby winner from the yearling sales, but has also bought a champion two-year-old from a breeze up sale, and they said, I want one of those. What, what, what would you say, what would your response be about how we're gonna go off and buy the next champion? 
Um, going back to the point that David made earlier, I think it's very much per client. So you, you sit down and we're in a fortunate position to have had success buying yearlings and buying breeze up horses. Um, and so again, it comes down to individual client. But I think what you find when new people come into the game is that they want quite instant, access, instant yeah. action. And that's probably true for all of us. You know, if suddenly rugby becomes your passion, you want to go to Twickenham or whatever it is. So I think that often I would steer them towards the breeze ups um, because, uh, and then you would go there to buy that certain type of horse that perhaps you might be able to buy and they can be at the races in three weeks time. That's a very feasible thing. You can sell the ask at Dream. You can, you know, you can give them all the options. So, but I think with somebody coming into it, often it's a great way to start is to go and buy a breeze up horse, and and hopefully, you know, you buy the horse at Doncaster in April, and you you're, you're at the races in May. Yeah, it's not really. Uh, it's the worst kept secret in racing at this stage. That that's what you want to do. The money is speaking for itself, especially for the speed, and potentially the the more middle distance, longer longer trip types are the ones that are still you can get a bit more value for money potentially within that kind of criteria? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think, the, I, I think be, because of that reason, because quite, you know, quite a lot of people do go to the breeze-ups to, um, to try and buy an Ascot two-year-old. And look, plenty of Ascot winners have come out of the breeze-ups. Uh, there is a premium on those. Mm -hmm. But there's a, premium on those, there's a premium on those at yearling sales as well. You, know, uh, you, you get a real solid, fast, looking well-bred two-year-old type they generally tend to make more until you get into the very highest echelons of of you know the top galileos and the top tabawi so yeah there probably is a sweet spot if you're willing to give a breeze up horse that little bit more time as, as david and i've done with many horses to you know a horse more tailored towards being a three-year-old okay and charlie with that in mind the the fastest horses and talking about it relating into the the, the, the best numbers ratings wise would you provide that we do number crunch, have a look at you know all these aspects and then provide for your clients a prediction yeah, what of where they'll get yeah, to. What we're trying to see is how where will this horse end up by its three year old career. That's sort of the, the target that we're going for. Yeah. Um, and if you have early success early on at Royal Ascot, I mean that's brilliant, but we're aiming for the three like that's that's what we're that we're assessing the horse on what will it do by the end of its three year old career. And also just back to the different types of horses that the nice thing about the breeze ups is it's very clear from a lot of the different sales they're selling a different type of horse. I mean, they're all doing the same thing, they're all breezing two furlongs, yeah. but the type of horse you get, the early types that you get at Doncaster, are very different from the more middle distance horses to the, and with the probably much more big, bold pedigrees at Arcana. So you can, you can also, if you have your client, can, you can point them to a certain type of sale if they're looking for a certain type of horse because you have that variability across the sales. Okay, yeah, fascinating, especially from different types of sales, as we know from the yearlings, I, I suppose. You know, book one, you're going to get your, your sexy horses, whereas Donkey see you get the... But this is also, it's delicious. almost by, by distance as well. It's all, they're almost split by distance, distance preferences at these types, different types of sales. It's very interesting. I'd like to go back then now to the story of, of, of Dream Ahead because obviously this is a, a horse where the, uh, for both of you sort of set new levels from, for, I'd imagine, your careers. But can you take me back to that because it was obviously quite a, a good point in your career, David, where you were searching for horses like this to bring you to the next echelon. What were your memories of that time of trying to find a horse? What was the, what was the client requirements that led you to purchasing him? Not being there. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you admitted to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> listen, we didn't really, I'll be truthful, we didn't really have an order at the sale. Um, and Richard was there and he basically said, I found a horse we must buy. Um, didn't have a client or anything. Really? And, um, and he said, we've just got to buy this horse. The figures are great. He stands up, he's got a pedigree, um, everything fits. And um, so, yeah, he went out and bought it and bought it very, very well for 36,000 or whatever he was. And um, you know, the rest is history. And, you know, I, I, I like blowing Dream Ahead's trumpet. I think, he yeah. was, you know, I said at the time, I don't think he'll ever train another one this good. He was a, a one, two, six, two year old, mm -hmm. joint champion, um, two year old. And often, if you are quite high as a two-year-old, you don't sustain that into your three-year-old career. You will drop. Your rating will drop. And he ended up being a one-two-eight um, three-year-old, and you know, beat Goldie Cover in his last start. And uh, you know, he ran nine times. He ran in one maiden, eight Group Ones, and won five of them. And um, like I said, I don't think I'll never get, ever get another one like that. Yeah, but you've, your success with the breeze ups and knowing 
but that's where he came from and obviously never thinking you might get one like that again but always hoping that's probably changed your outlook at that point to the breeze ups that suddenly you weren't there then but you were going to go to every other breeze up afterwards did it, did it really change your your approach to the sales um I, I, honestly i've usually put most of my faith in richard anyway <laughs> and and he you know i don't want to do the whole data i love looking at horses don't get me wrong but i don't want to go through figure after figure after figure okay. um and that's where Richard comes into it and he decides, yeah, this fits and we get a list and I'll go and see what he's put in front of me and like it or not like it. And even if I don't like it, and sometimes <laughs> buy it. And even if I like it, sometimes <laughs> I won't There's buy it. There's a lot of trust <laughs> here. It has to be. I mean, we, we've, be, yeah. we've worked together from day dot. So Richard was, um, Richard and I didn't have a client between us when we started. So joined forces and away we went. And it's been great fun and we can we can say what we like to each other and um, we can disagree with everything <laughs> but at the end of the day it's it's been successful it's still successful and um, like i said it's great fun as well and yeah. um you know trading these horses training them um you know it's 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 it, it's great you know i get paid to do this which is yeah. like <laughs> mad isn't it <laughs> But to that, you said it earlier on that, you know, your business is, you know, you've got to sell on horses, buying, sell, and obviously is, you know, buying and having these horses that dream ahead, but also the ones that you can look at and think, this is a horse that we could sell on to Australia and the likes, you know, that's where the money is coming nowadays. Is that part of your business plans at, the, at present? Very much so. I mean, to make it sustainable is very, very hard. Right. And we've tried our hardest to make it sustainable um, setting up syndicates selling timing of sales is so important but buying a type of horse that will go on to another jurisdiction um, this is where the vet becomes so important in the whole game it really really does um, certainly for us and um, yeah we we've we've enjoyed it and you only hear really hear about the good ones and we've had plenty of those from the results but there's also been some very very solid horses that have ended up in Hong Kong Mm -hmm. um, and we sold very well and you know it's kept the whole ball rolling and we're in a very fortunate position that we can go to the breeze up sales and we've got a, a healthy budget not a top budget but a very healthy budget to go and actually buy horses that we like and um, you know the, there's been times when we haven't had that budget and you watch them and sort of um, it's sometimes quite hard but when when we've got a nice budget we generally produce which is which is good. Yeah, and the the point on the likes of America, which is where the breeze ups were sort of founded, that's the, their inception. Do they? Do you think that's an edge if you've bought a horse from a breeze up and you're trying to sell it on, and the Americans have seen that it is breeze? That does that change their m mentality towards it for future training purposes? I'm not. I'm not sure. We we don't really market Austra America that much. Um, we we we're sort of you know our our markets are mainly Hong Kong, Australia. Hong Kong, Australia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, then we've got clients that want, you know, if they get a good horse, they'll keep it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but the American market really, for us, has a, you know the odd filly. Um, certainly, selling, you know, we've we've bought breeze up horses, fillies that we sold as maidens and sold them really well, and actually they've been worth more as maidens than they have as winners. Yeah. Um, and that's worked very well for us. And that, and that, if we're buying fillies, that's our market, really, yeah. for America. Right, well, David has got uh, some very important business with actual Breeze Ups who are, who are running. So we've let him go, and we're going to watch some of, some of the past success stories that uh, Richard has been involved with, and also having Charlie's intake of uh, what we're really looking for when we are dissecting these videos that we can see, and they're widely available on the internet. That's what's brilliant to see. You can go back, look at these champions, and really figure out what led you to buying them. We're going to start with the uh, the classic winner uh, with David. With, this is Tapal. But when, when you saw her here at Akana, she was just a, a daughter of Camacho, um, out of Jumana. So you've seen her pedigree, now you see her breeze. And what we want to know, uh, Richard, is what did you see in this? Uh, interestingly, I probably haven't watched this. I'm sure I haven't watched it since um, since we bought her. So the first thing I like is she's lot six, and I do like striking early because often it takes a while for markets <laughs> to warm up. So that's noted. But watching her breeze, um, watching her breeze here, this filly is um, she's actually quite green. Um, she's showing a little bit of knee action here, which means she's kind of cut a little bit high in her action. And when, you, um, when you're watching that, that can be for two reasons. One, greenness, or two, she may well uh, appreciate a little bit of cutting the ground. 
What you're also seeing here is, um, when you zoom in slightly, is you're just seeing her ears flicking backwards and forwards. And again, it's just a slight sign of, of greenness. This was a filly that we like to look at all of the horses um, paraded before they breeze. And this was a filly that was a particularly good looking filly. And to, so you, to then take that and then see that the way that she's breezed um, is, is it, you're trying to piece it together. So mm -hmm. in, in conclusion with her, she was a very good physical. She didn't do a particularly fast time, um, but she showed a really good action and a really good attitude. Um, and we could, because of her slight greenness in, in terms of her action and her, her ears flicking backwards and forwards, you could upgrade her time. So mm -hmm. um, she was, and again, being early in the sale, we were actually willing to go a little bit, uh, a little bit further on her. We liked her very much. But in terms of raw speed at the breeze, she wouldn't have been a particularly fast filly, but um, I can't actually remember where she was. Charlie might be able to remember. Um, but she, it was more the style in which she did it. She was... 105,000 euro by Camacho at the time, 2017. Did her price match what you thought she was going to be pedigree wise and what, and what you saw? Did you have to pay a little bit above? Do you think that was about right? I, I would have been happy to, uh, from memory, I think I was sort of valuing her at about 130, one, like just sub the 150. Mm. And I remember saying with David, um, who uh, probably won't thank me for saying it, but when we were in the ring, <laughs> it either. sort of got to, yeah, we were sort of getting up towards that 100 grand range and I was bidding pretty strong. And David was like, oh God, you know, she's Camacho. And I said, no, we're going here. And, and, and again, we've worked together since the start, since I started as an agent, he started training. He could tell I was mad to buy her and he was very happy to go with it. And then, you know, the, whoever was bidding against me stopped fairly quickly and we got her for that. So no, I was actually very happy to get her for that. And I think the fact, I think if she'd been lot 66, I think we probably would have had to pay closer to 150. Yeah, these are the things that you probably, we don't really know, we don't really hear about. It, it is, timing is always really key, but also, you know, w where they are at that stage of their career. You obviously saw Philly, yes, she's green, but she's gonna learn a huge amount from this. She's pricking her ears. She's doing things that she won't do in a couple of months time, which will bring her, above her peers when she gets to the racetrack. Yeah, and actually she was she was by Camacho and we were we were we always sort of aim at what are we thinking she is. We had I had it in my mind she would be a seven furlong filly. Mm. So up against others that would be bred to be five or six furlong, she didn't need to be clocking their sort of time. So in pure terms she wasn't from memory in the top twenty times, certainly. Um, but we were fine with that because we were grading her as a seven furlong filly, so she didn't need to be as fast as the five, six furlong horses. Yeah, and obviously she's gone on to, to win the French Thousand Guineas with massive I success. Got, yeah, I got a trip wrong. She was a mile. <laughs> <laughs> but that she's uh, she was one kind of horse, very different to some of the others we're going to look at. And we'll get Charlie, get your thoughts on the next one we'll look at. This is Lot 97 at the Goff Cell was a, just a colt by Fast Company. Can you talk me through what you and your what your role is when you're looking at horses at this stage? Yeah, so during the breeze, we we, um, we take times at uh, four different points throughout the breeze. You can see some of the timing gates in the video there. Um, we also then download the video afterwards and we measure the stride of the horse uh, in two places. So uh, once in the first furlong and then once towards the end of the breeze. And we do that uh, using slow motion video um, software. Uh, it's quite painstaking, but it is enlightening on how much you, how you can upgrade a horse's breeze time or breeze performance based based on their stride length. So light infantry, for example, he had an enormous stride length. Yeah, you can see that he really yeah. stretches out and, and uses his front legs that, so well. It's not, you, can, you can tell from the video, but it's nice to have the evidence there as well. Mm -hmm. And also um, Richard said that with Tepal that he, he said seven furlong horse and then the stride length can also be an indicator of what the trip would be. Mm -hmm. And so you can also use the, the time, what the pedigree suggests the trip would be, and the stride to then start building a picture of what you expect this horse to be and how, how you'd expect it to perform after the sale. He's a really interesting horse to watch, but obviously fast company, big stride, looks like a big unit of a horse. So are you saying his time it was it was wouldn't it be one of the quickest no, but yeah. all the other variables I mean it had a strong it had a, he had a strong time uh, yeah. I wouldn't say he was in the top wouldn't be the top 10 fastest but it was definitely fast and then when you have a fast time with a big stride length I mean that's quite it's a it's a good formula to have I mean native trail was the biggest stride length that we've ever measured we had to recheck it after we measured it because it was so much bigger than we than we'd ever seen before mm -hmm. and he had a good time and well, I mean native trail turned out to be another classic winner so 
With that in mind, and when you saw light infantry, what you've seen, we've obviously heard from Charlie's perspective. What was it, and you're using it based on your, your eye, your judgment, and you've seen thousands of these horses at this stage. He looks very different from what I'm seeing to some of, to say, the Camacho, and I know we're going to go over and see some of your, your, your very good two-year-olds, but what, what, what was it about him that made you think, this is, might be a bit different? Well, it's actually one of the things that Charlie's just said is actually that's quite interesting is that they had him in. So there's lots. Everyone takes their own times. We take our own times. Charlie does. And there's 10 other entities taking times is it sounds like you had this horse is cocking a pretty decent time. We actually didn't. I think in, in our times, I think he was somewhere in the 30, 40s in terms of just pure rank. Mm -hmm. The one piece of data that we have started taking off Charlie is stride length. And, and, and that is something that, that visually you can see the horse is a big stride, but it's like Charlie says, it's quite nice to back that up by, by seeing, and he, he did have a big stride. He was, um, he was a, he was a, he's a good size horse like infantry, mm. or, always was. He was very unfurnished at the sale, um, and he was a horse that we were gonna say, look, we're gonna buy the horse, and we're gonna give him time. We were, yeah. we were immediately not gonna rush this horse. Um, he was probably the best part of, he was probably the best part of 16 hands and half an inch at the yeah. sale and needed to furnish. So for us, again, not an electric time, but a beautiful action, low action, a yeah. horse that's going to act on firm ground. Although actually, I mean, this is my judgment of it then. It, 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 he won the uh, Horace Hill on very soft ground. I actually think he'll run on anything. Like, like all yeah, good horses, so I think he'll go on anything. But at the time, we were handicapping him uh, as a seven furlong horse that would go on quick ground. Yeah. Again, I got it wrong because he's a mile. <laughs> Does, this doesn't seem to matter a huge amount. He clearly had all the raw materials, yeah. didn't he? Just on the difference in times as we, um, because the youth, there are many different timing gates at the sales, and that creates some slight variation amongst the times. But we also uh, upgrade or downgrade certain times based on some characteristics of horses. And so yeah. we put the, we adjust our breeze time based on what we're expecting and how what, and what they deliver. So that's why there can be. I mean, okay. if you if you pass around the timesheet of the breeze up, because everyone's like, oh, have you seen the times? Seen the times? Yeah. The consigner like there were well, there are different different times, but it's because of the. Um, adjustments that we do to our times based on what we've measured. And okay. exactly the same as us. So we ours are adjusted, but we I will we will obviously adjust ours in a different way. To ch I don't know how they adjust ours. Never going to ask. Yeah. And uh, uh, and vice versa. We we adjust ours. So ours are always exactly the same as Charlie. So if you got Charlie's sheet and ours, they probably don't they probably don't look anything like. Which is which is great for the market because yeah. it means that you know it, it, again I think if you're just literally taking a timesheet, if you just get the raw times. I don't There's think that stands value. you in particularly good stead. I wouldn't say that's much value no, in just a raw time. They have to be handicapped. And if we did, the fastest horses would be mm. the most expensive horses. Which they are, but they're often not the horses that are the most successful, is that? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That is fun. yeah. So you need those discrepancies yeah. and different, yeah. different versions of how you, yeah. you, you judge it. You need Otherwise, to put the time in the context of the profile of the horse. Yeah. Which is to my point about the, seeing the pedigree and it matching what you're what you're looking at, and I think it, it, it moves us quite neatly on to the next horse we're going to look at, which is a colt by a, a, a sire that you purchased, our dad, when he was just a, a, a colt by Kodiak. This horse turned out to be perfect power. You probably had a, quite a lot of interest in our dads anyway, coming to the breeze ups. But did you think the our dads were going to be proper breeze up horses like he was himself? Uh, yeah, I think so because you, you know sires tend to pass on a lot of their own characteristics. Um, this horse was an easy purchase, to be honest with you. Um, I'd bought Ardell at the same sale five years before. He'd done a very, uh, a very good, very professional breeze. Perfect Powers breeze was less professional than his father's, but was still very good. You can see him here jumping straight off into the bridle, um, immediately into a good action, a quick action probably didn't have the longest of strides from memory, but I don't think that's that important when you're dealing with fast horses. Yeah. This horse was very much always going to be a five, six furlong horse. Here he's drifting, he's drifting across the track. Robson's riding him. He's had to put his stick through and he's gone from the middle of the track all the way over to the far rail. Doncaster is obviously a left-handed, um, is obviously a left-handed track and he would have done a practice breeze the next day. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, sorry, the previous day, and you do see them often come across the track because they know they're gonna, they know they're gonna go left. But um, look, this this was a horse, as I say, the similarities between him and his father were very, very easy to see, and he was a horse I would say I was unlikely to leave the sale without. And luckily, um, Sheikh Rashid um, 
Sheikh Rashid shared my opinion and we uh, and we bought him and we, we were delighted to get him, obviously. We talked earlier about the consigners and how you know, geniuses they are. What changed with this horse, do you think? Because you must have seen a lot of the Ardads as, as yearlings, from 16,000 he was as a yearling to a two-year-old buying him for 110 because, you know, that is an exceptional you know um, amount of money differences, but the horse himself must have improve physically yeah and again because I know the Sally and Sawal and the Sireline I think did you see him as a yearling did I you did. miss him yeah no I did I did I did see him in the uh, I, I did see him as a yearling and uh I thought he was just a horse you know I thought he was okay um but I I certainly um I wouldn't have been grading him particularly highly he did do very well from yearling to two-year-old and because I have obviously followed had and still do obviously follow all the art ads along they aren't probably the most attractive foals. They're much, they're much nicer yearlings. And then this horse had done again, and you do see them just continue to improve. They're always on an upward trajectory from when they're born to to their two year old. So he he had filled out an enormous amount and um, had turned into. He's a very good looking horse. I mean, he was a he was a he was a standout physical for me, mm. um, as as well as obviously showing a, a very professional mm. attitude in his breeze. Yeah, and Charlie, do you take into account? That what they were like as yearlings you obviously do have a lot of data for the yearlings would that data then sort of marry quite nicely um, into to yeah this plot? the amount that the consigners paid on the way in it factors into um what we consider and then also the the the, the broader pedigree of the horse but i wouldn't say we have m um much confirmation stuff from the yearling we don't feed that into it but um we, we mostly look at what is available before the sale um uh, pedigree and the price going in Mm. And also, who what consigner has got the horse? Because they consigners, they're all excellent, but they all breeze their horses in slightly different ways yeah. to reveal the best aspects of that horse. Which is probably why it made uh, made it easier for you when it came to to the um, to our dad being coming from Tally Ho, like um, the, uh, our dad did himself. So, sorry, perfect power came from Tally, Tally Ho, like our dad did himself, which we can see now. So question is what were the similarities that you could see between the two are oh, physic physically they're very similar horses um, they're both exceptional balance they're beautiful shoulders on them uh, they both stood up very very similar types you know it really was I, I said to Sheikh Rashid when I first seen him I was like mm. goodness this this li literally is the spitting image of uh, of his father and then obviously you know they still you, you wouldn't just buy him because he looked like his father you know he has to then go off and, and jump through all the hoops which he jumped through, um, which he jumped through very easily. And it, to me, he was. We, we grade all the breezes, and looking back, I mean, I haven't watched Perfect Powers Breeze until you've just shown it to me. Yeah. But uh, going going back, you know, w we do a very simple grading system, and he was he was in the highest grades. So, and do you look re retrospectively? Would you have seen um, our Perfect Power by our dad and compared him to what you had said about our dad when he was a breeze up? Yeah, very much so. I think our dad's breeze was more professional. Mm -hmm. um, perfect power is a bit greener. Mm -hmm. um, our dad himself, here he is on the screen. So he started in the middle of the track exactly as perfect power did. But as you can see, he stayed, stayed straight. He stayed in the straight line. Um, same jockey, Robson riding. Yeah. Um, yeah, there you go. I mean, the footage here isn't great because the start's been cut off. But the... Um, he's gone in the middle again you can see that low if you look at his stride his action and that head carriage that's a very willing head carriage it's head low it's ears back it's flat quick action that is what you're looking for in a two-year-old easy quick action head down this horse isn't green in any way shape or form he knows his job and he can go to the races in as he did, uh, you know, in a month, six weeks' time, and he's going to be ready to do the business. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned that you, we didn't see the beginning, we don't see the end. How, what were these? We, we've looked at just a handful of some of the best sources that you've seen. What was it about? Did, did all, did Tepal, did Light Infantry, did Perfect Power, did Arda, did they all have that temperament plus tick after their, 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 their Yeah, that, very much so. A huge part of our decision-making process is temperament, and every one of them ticked the box. Like... You know, it, it, for, for me, it's as important as anything. Mm. And um, yeah, they all showed. It, it, even in the, in the breezes there, you can see there's no sweating. They're nice and easy. Not, nobody, none of them are worrying. They're all, you know, they're all in a relaxed state. And that's exactly how they were down at the start. It's how they pulled up. Mm. And it's then how they were showing at the sales ground afterwards. And attributes that you want for racehorses, but also 
now as sires because we know our dad how popular he's been we like to hope that perfect power will be as well but from what we've heard our dad's just been pretty bomb proof hasn't he 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 puts bo- he was bomb proof temperament himself. Uh, I mean, like John's, you know, never saw a vet, never saw. Just John will tell you, you know, John Gosling obviously trained him. He said, you know, he just never really knew he was in the yard. Went about his work, ate, slept, uh, ate, ate, slept, drunk, went to sleep. I mean, that was literally it. Perfect power, exactly the same. Bomb proof temperament. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there has been this. Um, there are people out there that want to knock the breeze ups for. Um, you know, making crazy horses. It's, I think it's actually the opposite. I think you know, there's lots of lots of horses with temperament issues come out of yearling sales, and there's some horses that come out of breeze ups. But I, I think actually it's the opposite. I think because you can see much more of their temperament. I, I think it's. Um, I think it, if they come through that test, as I've said before, I think it's a great thing. Perfect power. An hour before the Norfolk, uh, Tina, who who looked after him, told me she, she had to wake him up. Yeah. He'd been gone down to Ascot, was absolutely yeah. fast asleep. The horse is a, com- is a complete dude. I was there after he'd run in the July Cup and my children, they're both patting him after a race and he just stood there. I mean, he's just, yeah, puts this bomb-proof temperament into them. So I'd say it leaves us to end quite nicely that why breeze ups, not just new, you can, you can create a racehorse, but you can create horses that are going to become sires and imagine you know, brood mares with the right minds, the right attitudes and because they've done it all early and they've got a long healthy career with that kind of right mindset. Yeah, I think so. Look, on the list we've discussed, there's another horse on there far above. He's at stud, there's Dream Ahead, there's Perfect Power, there's Ardad, there's four horses we purchased at, mm. at Breeze Ups that are now standing at stud and that's that's something we're, you know, that's something we're very proud of. And those horses have, those horses have got there, obviously not just through ability, but it's rare that top horses, uh, most top horses, have to have a decent temperament. And these have all come through the breeze up system, and they've they've all got, you know, every single one of those has got a superb temperament. And I, you know, I'm hoping that light infantry is going to add to the. Um, Kind of add to the group one role this year. Yeah, and add to the add to the size list. And finally, Charlie, with what you know, with the numbers you've seen, and the horses, and the quality, what do you think about the future of the breeze ups and, and, and what we've seen from the last couple of years going forward? Yeah, I think you know, the breeze up is stronger than ever. Um, the quality of the horse going in is improving massively, um, and the, the success that there has been has been fantastic. And it's a credit to the consigners who are prepping these horses. They've done a brilliant job. Uh, they are, as Richard and David said, they are excellent horsemen, and yeah, they they know what they're doing. And then it, but it's it's better for us because we have better horses at the sales. It's mm-hmm. yeah, it's really fantastic. So we've had uh, one thousand guineas winner. We've had classic winners come from the breeze ups. How long until a derby winner? Um, well, he's had a second knocking yeah. on the door. Yeah, yeah he's had a door. second. Um, Libertarian was second um, to Ruler of the World for Carl Burke. Um, it'll happen. I think I think you'd be a very brave man to say that it wouldn't. As you say, you know, Gold Cup winners, Guineas winners, um, you know, top class mile and a half horses. Um, yeah, I'd say it's only a matter of time. Well, from a man who bought a Derby winner, I think that's your fair fair judge to to make that assessment. Thank you so much. It's been enlightening and very interesting. And best of luck for this season.